Bible tonight now and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would please. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look together at verse number 14. Where the Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now, Father, I pray you'll help us as we open up your word this evening and we look at this important virtue that you desire that each of us have and that we would desire tonight and understand the process by which you work patience into each of our lives. And so, Lord, open our understanding, and I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll be the teacher tonight. Give me clarity as I speak and give the people understanding as they listen. And may your, your will be accomplished in each one of our hearts and lives tonight. It's my prayer. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about be patient. How many want me to hurry up and get it over with? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's how most of us are. Uh, boy, that's a, that's a title. I almost hesitated to even mention. That's what we were going to do. But, um, you know, patience. How many will admit right now you struggle with being patient? Okay, that's pretty much all of us. You know why? Because pinch yourself. Huh. That's why. We're flesh. That's why. And, you know, I had to chuckle tonight because I came out to leave and I left my house at 20 after 5 uh, to come down to the church and normally a 10-minute drive or so. And I got out there and I couldn't even get out on Georgesville Road. It was just solid. I had to, you know, somebody, I don't know what was going on or what happened. I thought maybe the freeway was backed up. The freeway was fine. Georgia Road was just clogged. It took me almost 15 minutes just to get onto the freeway. And most of you know I live right by the freeway. <laughs> and, uh, and I just had to chuckle saying, I'm preaching on be patient. <laughs> Say, That's real funny, God, you know. Huh? You think he doesn't test us on things? And, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, there's... There's two reasons that we have to be patient. The first reason is there'll always be problems. All right? Boy, that's encouraging, but it's truthful, isn't it? There'll always be problems. Sometimes it's the same problem, but most of the time it's going to be different problems, but there are always going to be problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You know what tribulation is? trouble okay everybody's going to have troubles don't think nobody no one gets by without them okay you're going to have troubles and then the the uh the second th reason that we need patience is because whatever problems we have though they can be solved quickly they rarely ever are there's usually no quick fixes okay it's uh it takes it takes a little longer to resolve problems because there's consequences and effects to our actions. We understand that. Sometimes we decide we're going to change something or do something different and things will go good for a while and then something from the past crops up or some uh, situation arises and we revert to old behavior real quick and we revert to an old way of handling things. And you may, you may decide you're going to eat differently and eat healthier or you're going to not eat certain things and but then something will come up or a stressful thing or a crisis thing and you turn to food and you go right back to where you, there, there it was the old things just come back so easily and so the, yeah you have to be patient now in this text here he's telling us to be patient toward all men. I want you to look at a couple other scriptures with me. In the book of James, would you turn to your right? In the book of James, go past the book of Hebrews and get to the book of James. I'm going to deal with this text a little bit later in the study, but I want you to look at it with me. James chapter 1. Notice verse number 2, where he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what, church? Patience. But let 
Patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Okay? I say we're going to take that apart a little bit towards the end of the study tonight. Notice in James chapter 5 with me, will you? The first two words of James 5 and verse 7. What are the first two words, church? Be patient. <laughs> Be patient. Therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord... And, and he gives the illustration here of the husbandman, or we would call him a farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So James is emphatically and several times reminding us to be patient. Be patience. Now, now listen, not just have patience. Be patient. There's a difference. It's not me just possessing it. It's me being it. Okay? It's part of my being. And don't, don't, don't cop out and say, I'm just not a patient person. Don't tell me to be patient. That's not the way I am. That's not the way I'm wired. Well, you're going to get wired differently because you're a Christian. And you belong to God. And you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And you're not just the way you always were. You're, you need to desire to be the way God wants you to be. And the way God desires for you to be. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about be patient. Number one, let's talk about the explanation of patience. The explanation of patience. What is patience? Someone said, well, patience is that ability to idle your motor when you feel like stripping the gears. Okay? That's not what patience is. I understand that. But patience is a virtue. Someone said this, patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in a woman and never in a man. Okay? Maybe that's true. But here's what Webster said, the 1828, about patient having the quality of enduring evils without murmurings or fretfulness, sustaining afflictions of body or mind with fortitude, calmness, or Christian submission to the divine will. Hmm. Patience. The ability to put up with people when you'd like to put them down. The spiritual definition is simply your, your ability to wait and let God do what he said he would do. You're going to see that bore out as we get into our lesson here tonight. And that's difficult for us to do in our country. Difficult to do growing up as Americans. Because we've been uh, so used to instant everything. It's hard to, hard to be patient and to wait when we live in a, a, a world of microwaves and uh, uh, instant uh, mashed potatoes and, you know, you don't, uh, they have uh, uh, tanning beds where you just lay in some place for a few minutes and you got a tan that would take hours to get otherwise. you got, you know, everything is now. I want it now. We, uh, how many of you remember when you first got the internet, it was dial-up? <laughs> Huh? And you'd wait and wait, but it was still pretty cool, we thought, huh? until they got higher speed internet. Huh? And, and now you wouldn't settle for something like that. You don't want 3G, you want 4G. Is there something bigger than 4G now? I'm sorry? Don't, don't talk that way in church. All right? <laughs> and um, so we, it, it's... It, you know why when you go to the doctor's office they call you patient because you have to wait at least an hour before you see anybody okay so you have to be patient we understand that I, I read about a man's car who stalled in heavy traffic light turned green he couldn't go anywhere his car wouldn't wouldn't go and so he despite all his efforts he got out and opened the hood and was looking and he had all these cars behind him, especially the guy right behind him, just laying on his horn. And finally, he went back to that first driver of the car, and the guy rolled down his window, and he said, listen, um, I'm sorry, 
I can't seem to get my car started. He said, but if you'll go up there and give it a try, I'll sit here and honk the horn for you. <laughs> I like that. You have to have patience. The virtue of patience. Listen, we're tested daily. Here's what tests our patience. Interruptions. Interruptions. Inconveniences. Irritations. And inactivity. That all tests our patience. Remember, patience is an ability to endure annoyances, pain, provocation without complaint, without losing your temper, without getting irritable. Remember, we, we talked about love and, and charity a few weeks ago when he talked about how it suffers long and is kind. It's still kind. It's not, getting, it's not getting restless. It's not getting frustrated. It's not getting irritated with delay. That's why patience is tied to our faith in God. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, will you? If you're still in James, just go to your left there. One book is the book of Hebrews right in front of the book of James. Look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Notice verse number 12. Hebrews 6 and verse 12. Notice that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience do what? Inherit the promises. Did you notice to see the promises of God, to receive the promises of God, you don't just have to have faith. You have to have faith in what? Patience. Patience. If you don't have faith, sometimes you say, well, I had promise. I, I was trusting that promise and God didn't come through. No, God might have come through. You were short on patience. You, got, you didn't wait for God to come through. You didn't come through by your deadline and so you gave up on him and you did it your way. Faith and patience. You know, it's not hard to find faith preachers it's not so common to find patience preachers. Patience. Because everybody wants a quick fix. And it doesn't work that way. You know, we, we talk about our RU program on Friday nights and we're coming up on our sixth anniversary. I, don't, I don't look, haven't looked recently at the numbers, but I know coming up on the fifth anniversary, I think we had added up there have been over 600 people that have come through on Friday nights. You know what we normally have on a Friday night? Oh, 25, 28, sometimes 33, 32. So what happened to all those people? Many of them wanted a quick fix. Just, just pray over me or just, you know, just let me, let me pray a prayer, ask Jesus save me and I'm good. And then when it comes to Work and diligence and applying myself and letting God change my life and that takes some patience. Huh? They're not interested in that. It's not just all you folks. That's you and me. That's all of us. That's why James says you have to let patience have her perfect work. Patience is going to work. It's going to. It's going to have a. It's going to take some time. Patience isn't just human willpower. Patience is not just human willpower. It isn't just you or me psyching ourselves up saying, I'll be patient today if it kills me. Okay? That's not patience. That's not what God's talking about here. It's not, it's not willpower. It's not saying, he, no, I, they don't irritate me. They don't irritate me. But inside, I'm ready to boil over. That's not, what a, that's not what patient is. It's not pretending to be okay when you're not okay. It's not a mask. Okay? It's not trying to put on a facade. It's, it's allowing God to develop the virtue of patience in me. 
where I depend completely on Him in every situation and every circumstance. That's patience. I'm going to allow God to develop the virtue in me where I depend completely on Him in every situation and circumstance. That's patience. It's not something you work up. It's something that God works in. Okay? You'll see that as we go over some examples. Number two is the examples of patience. The good thing is there's some examples in the Bible. Some, some good examples and some not so good examples. You'll discover the difference oftentimes, listen, the difference in answers to prayer or no answers to prayer, between battles won or battles lost, between promotion or demotion, is oftentimes found right here in this virtue called patience. Be patient. The difference rarely comes because of looks or talent or education or ability. It comes because of patience. You ever think about Esau? You don't really think of Esau and patience, do you? He was very impatient. What about Saul? What cost Saul his kingdom? Impatience. Well, I waited as long as I could, Samuel, but you were late and I just couldn't wait any longer. Impatient. It cost him. Jello. Jello recently celebrated its 120th anniversary. There's a trivia fact for you. The man who invented it in 1897 was a man by the name of Pearl Waite, W-A-I-T. He wore several hats. He was a construction worker, but he dabbled in patent medicines, and he went door-to-door -door selling homemade remedies. In the midst of his tinkering, he came upon the idea of mixing fruit flavoring with granulated gelatin. His wife named it Jell-O. Waite thought it was just another product he was trying to peddle. And it's when sales didn't go as fast as he thought they should, a few months after developing the product, he sold all the rights to a man named Orator Woodward for $450. Woodward knew the bargain he got. Understanding the value of marketing and patience, within eight years, he turned the $450 investment into a $1 million business. Today, not a single relative of Pearl Weight gets one dime from the over 1.1 million boxes of Jell-O that sell every single day. Why? He couldn't wait. He couldn't, he didn't have the patience. But let's look at some Bible examples. Let's talk about Abraham. Let's talk about Abraham. He's the first example. Abraham was a man of faith. In fact, he's called the father of faith. Romans chapter 4. And he's a man of faith. Uh, if there was anything that lacked in Abraham's life, it was probably patience. Patience. I understand. I, I, I feel for him. The angel came and said, okay, you and your wife Sarah, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a baby. I'm going to, I'm going to, look, Abraham, look at the stars. Your descendants are going to be like stars of heaven and, and see the sand? They're going to be like the sand. Well, that's pretty good. Now, Abraham probably thought, well, you know what? Babies usually come in nine months. In this case, though, it wasn't nine months. It ended up being 25 years. Well, during the long, along that time, in 25 years, not only did Abraham get impatient, but who else did? Sarah did. Said, well, hey, Abraham, it ain't happening. Remember, you have to have faith and patience to inherit the promises. Hey, it's not happening. Uh, here's Hagar. She's my handmaid. You have relations with her and have a baby with her. That was a normal common thing in those days with handmaidens when a wife was barren. And so, of course, he did. And there was a son born named Ishmael, who is, by the way, the father of the Arab race. 
You think there's any repercussions from that impatience that we still see today? Absolutely. The whole world is affected by the impatience of Abraham and Sarah. Eventually, hey, did God keep his promise? Huh, sure did. Isaac did come. Isaac came on the scene. Be patient. Be patient. God's given you a promise. God's given you a calling. God's given you a ministry. God's given you a hope of some kind. Don't give up. Sometimes we give up and we miss out on what God would have for us. And it's not because we didn't have faith. It's because we didn't have patience. We weren't willing to wait to see what God wanted to do. Be patient. Let's talk about David, secondly. What about David? Now, if anything would stand out about David, I think you could say he had some patience. God, when, when, God, when, when Saul did his, his episode and, and, and God told Samuel, now I want you to go to the house of Jesse, you're going to anoint the next king. You remember the story, just, uh, David was out with the sheep, and so he anointed all the other guys first, and kept, God kept saying, Samuel kept saying, this has got to be the one. And God would say, nope, not the one. Then next guy, oh, this surely would be the Lord. Nope, not him either. I think Samuel said, man, all right, Jesse, you got anybody else? Oh, yeah, I got one guy out in the field still. Well, bring him in. God hasn't said anything yet. And so here comes David, and God says, there he is. There he is. David was 17 years old. 17 years old when, when Samuel anointed him to be the next king in Israel. You know when David became king and actually took the throne? 40 years of age. 23 years later. Hmm. wonder how many of us would have waited 23 years for God to fill his promise. Wonder, hey, in David, David had some mighty men. He had some buddies with him that wanted him to take it into his own hands on several occasions. When Saul would chase him, you know, David never brought it up to Saul and said, hey, buddy, I'm going to have your throne one day. Just watch. David never said that. And when the guys who were with him, when there were times he had Saul dead to rights, so to speak, he was sleeping and David was there. Remember, he cut off a little bit of Saul's robe. And his, and his men with him said, now's your chance, David. Take him out. David said, I won't lift up my hand against God's anointed. You know what that's called? Patience. He said, I will wait for God to do it in his time and in his way. I'm not going to take it into my own hands. Patience. You know, God calls you to a ministry or God calls you to do something for him. One of the most difficult things you learn is that He's going to take some time to develop you and to grow you and to teach you. When, when, when I felt the Lord wanted me to go into the ministry, it was, it was, I'm going to go away to Bible college and get prepared and to get trained. That took five years. I was a fast learner. Huh? Cram those four years into five, buddy. And listen... But, but that was because God had to prepare me. So he had a work to do in me. Someone's called to go to a mission field and called to serve God in a foreign field. You know what it takes? It takes time for God to begin to develop you. What hurts many missionaries is impatience. Hard to, hard to wait those four years, five years, or six years or so till, till you get to do what God wants you to do. One of the hardest things what John and Emily are doing right now. One of the hardest things is what... what Xavier and Felicia are doing right now. Having faith and patience to let God develop them and God work in them and to make them into what he wants them to be. Waiting for the fullness of that calling and remaining patient. David was also patient when he faced some problems, setbacks in his life, like Ziklag, 
when he came back to Ziklag after being with the Philistines and he was gone for a little over a year. When he came to Ziklag with his mighty men, what did he find? Who remembers? The city had been what? Burned. Everybody was gone. The wives and the kids, they're gone, taken captive by the Amalekites. Huh. Oh, his followers really took that well, didn't they? No, they didn't take it well. What did they say? David, it's your fault. In fact, they talked about stoning him. Let's kill him. And David wrote in Psalm 40, in response to that, he wrote, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. But you know what David was saying? Be patient. Be patient. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't have any, what we would call a knee-jerk reaction. He didn't just say, man, what are you guys talking about? Get off my back. Huh? He didn't say any. He just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to God about this. And he was patient. Be patient. You see it with Abraham. You see it with David. Let's talk about Job. James brought him up, didn't he? You've heard of the patience of Job. Anytime you hear the word Job, usually somewhere in that context you're going to hear the word patience. We count them happy that endure. You've heard of the patience of Job. Despite his whole world come crashing down, income destroyed, crops destroyed, children dead, body full of pain, wife says curse God and die, Despite all of that, I think I listed the verses for you there. Job 13, 15 says this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job 19, 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job 23, 8 through 10, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I can't perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I can't behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. Job was saying, what, what am I doing? I don't see God anywhere. You ever been there? He said, where's God? I look up and he's not there. And behind me he's not there. And the right hand he's not there. The left hand he's hiding himself from me. But you know what Job said? Verse 10, he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know what happened. Job 42, when it was all over. Huh? What did Job get? He got double. Everything. The Bible says, The Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than at the beginning. He had 14,000 sheep instead of seven. He had 6,000 camels instead of three. He had 1,000 yoke of oxen. And a thousand she-asses. And he just had 500 before. God doubled everything. But it says he also had seven sons and three daughters. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. He had seven sons and three daughters before this happened. How come he got double of everything else but he didn't double his children? Oh, he doubled his children. Why? There's seven sons and three daughters in heaven. And now there's seven sons and three daughters on earth. He's got double. Okay? The animals cease to exist. People don't. People don't. They're, sorry about that. Some of you think Fifi and Rover are going to be with you forever, but they're not. All right? Be patient. Be patient. It's all right. Examples. Job would say, be patient. So we see the explanation of patience, the examples of patience. Now let's talk about the effect of patience. The effect of patience. When you're patient, you're allowing God time to work. And when you allow God time to work, He never fails. If there's a time in your life and you look and say, well, God failed me, I would say to you, God never fails. You either lost your faith in Him, or you were not willing to be patient until He fulfilled His promise. 
You need faith and patience. Remember he said in James 5 and verse 7 how the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. A reference to farming. Uh, any farmers in here? I didn't think so. We'd, we don't have farms hardly anymore. A few folks do, but a lot of them have been bought up. And uh, it's hard to, hard to find people who understand the, the, the procedure. In fact, it's funny. You, in a lot of schools, they'll, they'll give tests and they'll, they'll ask, you know, where, do you get, where, do you, where does milk come from? You won't believe how many kids will say the store, supermarket. They have no idea it comes from a cow. They're, they're a loss. They, they, that's how far away we've come from the farm. But he's saying when a farmer, uh, all that he goes through in preparing the soil and then planting the seed and then fertilizing it and working the ground and watering it and, and counting on God and counting on the rain. Here it mentions the early and the latter rain. He does all that time. And listen, there's, there, eventually he's doing all that because there's not just seed time, there's also harvest time. But, but you understand, it, there's a, by the way, that's a principle God set up back in Genesis 8.22 after the flood. He said, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. And news for you, uh, climate change people, okay? There's a promise for you. Did you see what he said? There's always going to be cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night. It's going to happen. It ain't going to change. Don't think you're so big and mighty, man, that you can thwart what God has said. Okay? It's always going to be hot and cold, uh, day and night, summer and winter. Uh, we're always going to have the seasons. So, now, now let me ask you this. What comes between seed time and harvest time? What comes between there? Time. You don't, you don't put seed in the ground and go out the next day and say, okay, what do I got? You know what you got? You got dirt. Okay? You don't have anything. It takes time. We go by the minute. God goes by the harvest. We go by the, the second, but God measures time by the seed. Patience. You know, oftentimes... You can go out and look at that seed that you planted two days ago in the ground and it looks like nothing's happening because you don't see anything happening. Let me ask you a question. Is something happening? Yeah. When you don't see anything happening, God's up to something. Be sure of that. God, there's one thing God never does. You know what that is? Nothing. Okay? He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's always active. Just because you don't see something happening doesn't mean something isn't happening. When it seems like nothing's happening, God's up to something. It's through faith and patience we inherit the promises. Let me show you something. Uh, go to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 8. Are you okay? You all right? You having patience with the message? Luke chapter 8. This is uh, Luke's account of the parable of the sower. You remember the parable of the sower? There's four different soils that the ground falls into or falls on. Only one of them brought forth fruit. That was the very last one. And that was called good ground. Okay? And he gives us that in Luke 8 and verse number 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit. Does the verse end there? Oh, there's two more words, isn't there? How do you bring forth fruit? Patience. Takes time. Takes time. Why don't you make sure you don't don't rush the fruit. 
God's going to do a work in your life. God's doing a work in other people's lives. Don't rush the fruit. You can't, you pull that fruit off early and it doesn't taste good. Let it ripen. Let it bring forth fruit. I can't, you can't make, listen, you can't make a tree produce fruit. You can only get the tree healthy and it'll produce the fruit. What's the job of the pastor in the church? You know what the job of the pastor really is? I'm trying to make the fruit trees healthy so you'll bear fruit. I can't make you bear fruit. I can't guilt you into being fruitful. I just have to get you healthy. And if I can give you the word of God, the water of the word, and, and the, the nutrients that the word of God gives to you, you know what? You'll bring forth fruit, but it takes patience. Don't get impatient. Don't get impatient with others. Don't get impatient with yourself. Okay? You have to bring forth fruit with patience. Patience. Now, look back at James chapter 1 with me again, will you? James chapter 1, and we'll wrap this up. Said so we were going to talk about James 1, 2 through 4, and I want you to look at those verses with me. Notice what he says. My brethren, is he talking to believers? Yeah, that's why he calls them brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So he's saying that then, then you have to let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, the word perfect here, again, as we've, we've said before, you can be perfect and entire. That means mature as a Christian. It means you, God desires that you and I be a full-grown Christian. There's no maturity without patience. And there's no patience without trials. Let me ask you a question. How many, how many have small children at home? Let me see your hand. Children, grandchildren, let me see your hand. Okay, all right. How many of you have patient children at home? I'll give you a moment. Yeah. They're just a characteristic of children. They're just not patient. You tell them, uh, you, you don't, uh, you know, we have uh, Drew there. And, you know, you tell Drew he's going to do something in two weeks. It's like every day for the next two weeks I'll ask you, this is, this is happening. It's hard to, hard to wait for something. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you have to don't have a concept of that. You know, they want it and they want it now. That's, that's a sign of immaturity. But notice he said, you're going to be perfect, mature, and entire. Or, or that means complete. And that doesn't just mean physically. It means in all of our parts. It means our emotions and our will. That God, God wants us complete and mature in every part of our life. Grown up. Ephesians says we're growing up into him. One of the problems that you do, if you'll fight God, uh, God trying your faith, that'll work the patience, and you're fighting, letting patience work in your life, you're stunting your growth. And that's why you're still a baby, spiritually. You're not allowing God, not allowing Him to do the work of patience in your life. Notice what He says. You'll be perfect, you'll be mature, you'll be entire, you'll be complete, wanting nothing. That doesn't mean I won't desire anything. It means you won't lack anything. It means it's the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't mean you won't want anything. It means I don't lack anything. Why? He supplies everything I need. It means I'm lacking nothing. That's an amazing statement. That's a strong expression. God says you'll be able to be a complete person a well-rounded person, a mature person who's going to be able to face any situation, face any circumstance of life. But God says uh, to, for you to be mature and complete in that way, there's only one way for me to get you there. That's suffering. That's trials. That's through some troubles. That's the only way to get it. Now, suffering always does one of two things. Suffering drives you to God, or suffering drives you to despair. 
It drives you away from God. So when you look at verses 2 through 4, I think the key, the key to it all is verse number 4, the second word. What's the second word of verse 4? Let. Let. How come I don't have patience? How come letting God develop them? You know why? Because you're not letting Him. You have to let Him. Let patience have its perfect work. You know what that means? A surrendered will. I'm surrendered to God. The adversity is not what stops you. The troubles or the trials are not what stops you. We, 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 we draw short of the objective. We draw short of what God wants to accomplish. You know why? Because we, have, we refuse to allow Him to complete the work. Boy, it's quiet in here tonight. Hmm. We need this, you know that? Need patience. Let me understand. We're oftentimes in a hurry and God never is. God never is. That's why that's why so many situations you 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 have to learn to be patient. Let's see what God's gonna do with this. So often, you know. You, you learn in, in situations in life sometimes when someone, and, and I learned as a pastor, sometimes people when they call me up and, and, and Pastor, we got this going on. You got to come. You got to come right away. You know what I try to do? I try to be patient. Oftentimes, especially, uh, can I help you? Especially when it's husband and wife. My general rule is I'll wait at least two days. Because you know what happens? You call back in a couple days and you know what it is? Oh, we, we, we worked it out. Everything's okay. Hmm? Sometimes we go out and we grab a situation that we don't need to grab. Because we're trying to solve it instead of waiting on God to take care of it. God can handle it. And sometimes we grab situations he doesn't intend us to. And God says in the book of Proverbs, like grabbing a dog by the ears. How many understand dogs don't like that? Hmm? How many understand humans don't like that? <laughs> Huh? Don't grab you by the ears, huh? So be patient. Now listen, being patient isn't just passive. We talked about that when we're waiting on the Lord. It's not just a passive thing. You're continuing to work. You're continuing to serve. You're continuing to witness. Remember Hebrews 12 and verse 1? Are, are you in James? James 1? Can you go back? Mine's just one page. I turn one page. Hebrews 12. You're familiar with this verse. Will you look at verse 1? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Here's patience, but we're not sitting. We're not just standing. What are we doing? We're running. We're serving God. We're doing what God wants us to do. We're involved in ministry and serving Him. But we do it with patience. Patience. Let's run, Bible Baptist Church. Let's keep running. Doing what God has for us to do, but let's remember to be patient. Be patient. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth here this evening. Oh, there's so much that I feel like we could deal with with this subject. And Lord, it, maybe I'd have to go another week on patience. But we need this. We need you to work this virtue in our life. We get so short and so irritable and so frustrated when things don't go, not just the way we want them to go, but on the timetable we want them to go. We're not allowing you and allowing patience to have her perfect work. And Lord, tonight I pray that 
there would be numbers of people in this room who would say, I'm going to ask God to work in me the virtue of patience. Not to be irritable. Not to be upset. Not to get angry. Not to get frustrated while I'm waiting on a situation. Waiting on an answer. That I have to have faith and patience to inherit His promises. Lord, forgive us for the many times we get impatient while we're waiting on You. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. I could have an invitation this evening, but I would like to pray for you this evening. I don't know how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has dealt with my heart tonight about this thing of patience. And I'm asking God tonight that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell God I'm going to let patience have her perfect work in me. That he can make me to be complete, perfect, mature. That I lack nothing. That I'll face every situation and every circumstance and every person in my life with the assurance that God can take care of me. That God will work this out. Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart tonight. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up and say that tonight? Can I pray for you? Wonderful. Amen. Many, many hands tonight. You may put them down. Father, you've seen the hands this evening. Thank you for speaking to hearts. Thank you for meeting with us and dealing with us through your word. Now, Lord, help us tonight. I know we'll face the test, maybe even before we leave the church property. But remind us of what we've heard tonight. Don't let us be hearers of the word and not be doers of the word. But Father, let us be blessed in our deeds. I pray, Lord, that you'll work in us and through us that which is well-pleasing in your sight and that we will run with patience the race that is set before us for your glory and for your honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Did I? Hold on. Hold on. Did I talk about candy? No. Missions Conference candy for the parade on Saturday. Uh, where are they supposed to bring that? Back to the office. We have a big container back there, and they'll put it in there. But uh, remember to bring that, would you? Just grab any, any kind of candy. Unless it's chocolate, then you just put that in the left door when you walk in the office, and <laughs> we'll see to it that's well cared for. Amen. All right? Let's sing now. The windows of heaven are open. All right? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.